Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Susan, for sharing your knowledge with us. And ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to our next session that is Beauty in the Beast. In the words of author Christopher Morley, all cities are mad, but the madness is gallant. All cities are beautiful, but the beauty is grim. Is beauty and the focus on aesthetics a smart idea? Let's find out in this session. Ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker is Mr. Ratan J. Bartleboy. He's the founder and principal architect at Ratan J. Bartleboy Consultants Private Limited. His works adopt an integrated approach to design by challenging conventional beliefs of aesthetics and planning. It engages with multiplicity of interdisciplinary issues concerning cost-effective solutions which have the characteristic hallmark of good design. Case in point being some of his works in urban design and planning, including the Marine Drive Makeover, the Bandra Voli Ceiling, the Yamuna Bridge, and the various other architecture, interior, and retail design projects. So can we have a huge round of applause, please? Ladies and gentlemen, for Mr. Batliboy. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's a fabulous topic. We have many interpretations. I'm going to take one route and go forward. Defining smart, I thought we'd just do these classic definitions and then we'll see where it goes. Uh, I don't know how many of you know what the definition of smart is. Hands up here. What does the smart, S-M-A-R-T, the original definition stand for? We have this interpretation of smart cities, villages, buildings, infrastructure, technologies, societies, smart self. The way we're looking at it is smart is a goal. The way I'm looking at it is smart is not a place to be. It's pretty much a destination towards which we head. The original definition of smart is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Even I didn't know that, and every time I think about it, I can't get these words in my head. When we talk about smart for space, and that's the sort of pitch I'm taking because I'm an architect and sort of gotten to urban design in a big way because of our larger projects, we look at smart and the S could stand for anything else. It could be scientific, spatial, sustainable, the same way as the M, the same as way A, the same as the R, and the same as the T. And all these definitions of smart or all these adjectives or verbs or nouns, the way you want it, whichever way you like, sort of add and picked a, paint a pretty picture for us in terms of what we can do and how, can we, how we can do it on our projects. So if I string, say, spatial with multi-user, with affordable, with responsible, and probably transparent, it has a completely different connotation to us as if I strung some other string of words. What is beauty? The classic beauty is the classic beauty. It could be anything. It's for visualizers or, or architects or urban designers or, or people. It's the classics. I'm looking at beauty being skin deep. So we have a situation where somebody paints a building and that's considered beautiful. But that building sits in a context which is pretty much not beautiful. If we look at beauty as a coping mechanism, this is what a project has done in Bombay on the slums. And it's pretty much like this. If we look at beauty as a coping mechanism, it could also be this. This is a young girl trying to use a swing, a, a, a sort of symbol of joy, and cope with where she lives and what environment she comes from. If you look at beauty in the eyes of the beholder, here I am in this penthouse flat looking down at this slum which I didn't want to see, and an artist has converted this slum into beautiful patchwork of, you know, beautiful plastics. From the beholder's perspective, this is what it is. But from the user's perspective, it's still this. The user is still looking at a life which is happening under the plastic sheets. If you look at the many faces of beauty, 
We're talking about people being sensitive to their environments, about people being sensitive to just sort of, you know, lipstick on a frog. It's not design, it's decoration. It's something to cope with. You paint an old building, it makes it look good. You feel good about it. It's a way of looking at your own lifestyle. If you look at the many-hearted urban beast, we're looking at, I'm looking at interpreting the city as an urban beast. Uh, we talked about everything else, and I'm going to show you some pretty hard visuals here. So we're talking about housing. We're talking about middle class, upper class housing. We're talking about, you know, sort of a lower level of housing. We're talking about our classic slums. We're talking about the city of disparities. We're talking about how to cope with this. We have the crowded city. These are classic Bombay environment shots. The crowded city gets worse. It's about people, it's about traffic. It's about multimodal transportation things. This is a typical shot of a Bombay environment on a morning or an evening trying to get home on the suburban trains. This is not a, a very rare occurrence in a Bombay environment. I live in Bombay, I live amongst this. We have transportation that continues to happen. We carry about 9 million people on a daily basis on trips in Bombay on our suburban rail. Uh, the one square meter in our railway compartments carries 16.8 people in one square meter. In 1988, when I was doing the railway project with Mr. Jha, at that time, the Toronto Transit Authority had come down, and we were talking about China having 12 people per square kilometer, and those guys couldn't figure it out. And here, 25 years later, we're talking about 16.8 people per square meter in the train. We have issues of garbage. So, what is the urban beast? We're talking about almost everything in an urban context. We've been hearing about cities, we've been hearing about where we're going, we've been hearing about how we're going there, how can technology help, and there are several ways and meanings to this. I'm staying away from the technology bit because effectively everybody's talking technology. How is the urban beast taking advantage of societies? The urban beast, governance, politics, people, administration, is taking advantage of people's socio-economic disparities. It's taking advantage of people's faith, faith in God, ki ho jayega sab kuch. Faith in, or, or fate, this is my fate, this is my boss's fate, this is what I was born to do. People have become non-demanding because they realize that whatever you demand is not going to happen in any case. They don't have a collective voice. Politics is sort of, you know, buying votes but not doing anything about it. Tolerance or intolerance we've been hearing about for a while now. So how do you deal with this urban beast? Do we slay the beast or do we try and tame the beast? I'm going to look at one of our projects and quickly illustrate where and what we did and how we did it. Uh, this was a project about 10 years old now, about the refurbishment of Marine Drive. So Marine Drive in 2004 looked like this. There was a broken wall, there was broken footpaths. Uh, you couldn't walk on Marine Drive, it was distressful. There were things happening on Marine Drive that you didn't want to know about. People stopped coming to Marine Drive. And Marine Drive was really the lung of Bombay. It was a lung where people came out from the, the armpits of Bombay and came out to get some fresh air. So we made a sort of rule book, uh, 10 rules that we played with. Non-intrusive, sustainable, durable, user comfort. We talked about barrier-free, we talked about minimal maintenance, we talked about structural safety, and it had to be some sort of progressive situation. New materials, new technologies, etc. The most important thing was it was a public space. 
And to deal with this public space, we had a very intense process. We got all the NGOs involved. This was a project where governments, where the administration, where the people were all inclined and aligned. Nobody wanted to object to this marine drive situation because they, everybody felt that it was going to benefit them. And when you have a benefit that is going to share with everybody, I think that's where alignment happens. Where people thought the beast was going to be the government or the politics and the prince was going to be the people, uh, my experience was that the people actually killed the beast. The people turned out to be the people that stopped the Marine Drive project from continuing to happen. Because people started demanding what they wanted on the project, and these were small groups of NGOs and small groups of citizens' committees which didn't know what they wanted and started fighting amongst each other. So all the administration did was step back and says, if I do this for you, you'll be upset, and if I do that for him, you'll be upset again. So why don't I do nothing? And that's how the project was sort of thrown out of the ground. Sorry to interrupt, we have another five minutes. Yeah. So designing for the masses, we had marine drive that looked like this in 1930, marine drive that looked like this in 2004 when we started, and marine drive that looked like this in 2014. And primarily we said, why fix it if it isn't broken? No change for change's sake. Designing for the masses, if we talked about marine drive and it looked like this, this is after we'd done the refurbishment, there were several alt uh, alternative processes and pro uh, options that we had. If we decided to do marine drive like this, it was exciting, it may have worked, but the point is marine drive had a certain function for the city, and these are the kind of functions that marine drive played towards. So this is an air show that happens outside of Marine Drive. And these are people that gather on Marine Drive. <laughs> Thank you. To watch the air show. This is the Republic Day Parade. There's the Bombay Marathon that happens. There's Diwali that happens. Fireworks that happen. There's yoga that happens. There's yoga day that happened, which people are aware of. If you design for the masses, the most challenging thing that we had was to design for nothingness. People don't want over design. At least we didn't want it. So we had to pull away from what we wanted to do and say, listen, let's restrict ourselves. Let's look at design being less rather than more. So we created Marine Drive exactly the same as it was, just much better, much cleaner, much hardier, much more durable. You allowed this to happen. We created a gray Marine Drive and people got very upset saying there's no color, you're not designing anything. And we said the people will bring the color that they need. We talked about bus stops which looked gray and completely bare and stainless steel. And we looked at very, very minimalistic structure. But these were bus stops, BEST, which is our uh, uh, public supply, public uh, transportation supply, has their very bold color red. And so we introduced that on the underside. We didn't need everybody to know that it was red. The people at the bus stop sort of got under the red glow. We created details and many, many details in the way we finished it. So you can see the different colors of grays. We had markers, we had distance markers in both directions. We had paving stones. We had a sort of wave pattern as you walked Marine Drive and I'll show you a detail of that next. You can see how the tiles sort of create sort of compression force, uh, a sort of compression visual as you walked along. A gentle two-minute reminder. Thank you. 
and we had details because we had to incline the seats so that they were comfortable. But if you incline the seats, you get water falling in them. And how do you pour the water out in our Bombay monsoons? So we had these kind of spouts built in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in a marine drive context, and I'm just bringing it close to where we are, uh, it was very difficult to try and keep everybody happy. And the rule that we had was it's a 90-10 or 95-5. If 95% people of the pe uh, 95 of the people who are using Marine Drive are happy, it's a successful project. If the 5% want walking tracks or, or places where their dogs can poo or a running track or skateboarding, and it did not help the masses, we didn't do it. So in conclusion, what we're saying is, what are smart urban spaces? The way I'd look at it is sustainable, multi-user, adaptive, responsive, and tactful. In principle, we're saying it could be also spatial, stimulating, social, scalable, malleable, manageable, meaningful, accessible, affordable, aesthetic, aware, resourceful, responsible, reliable, technological, transparent, transversal, scalable, transient, that kind of thing. And I think we added two more layers, which was experiential and resilient. And by this, we're trying to do smarter rather than smart. And here we have an open-ended situation which could be efficient, emergent, equitable, et cetera, et cetera. You can put your own definitions on that. Regenerative and reclaimable. Smart is to design integrated experiential spaces, to co-create smart spaces for society. We've done that, and we can continue to do that. Smarter, however, is to develop smart societies to demand smarter spaces. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, our next uh, speaker in this session is Mr. Dhananjay Dake. He's an architectural engineer and the founder of the firm Construction Catalyzers. A mechanical engineer by training, he specializes in new age architectural engineering. His work experience ranges from designing, manufacturing, and installing structures. And he's currently working towards uh, creating service integral structures and efficient synergy of the five elements. And uh, here we have Mr. Dhananjay. Welcome, sir. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, this Beauty in the Beast, uh, as we see, <coughs> is not in, uh, I would put up as a context to the entire city as such, but I would like to put this up in individual points uh, where uh, I would speak in this region of uh, the architectural engineering aspect of or a kind of art, sometimes you can say uh, useless for daily life. This aesthetics by in in inevitable engineering for architecture subsequently would become an art. Now, this is something, little funny statement, but uh, what I would like to say is, 
there are so many ways that <coughs> you can put forth engineering solutions uh, to various uh, various structures and uh, we'll discuss some of the issues in larger city fabric level where you have always resource constraints and then exigencies of uh, climate change. There is information boom and demanding inputs. Compressed schedules always uh, people want it yesterday. Quite often the solutions become very complex and uh, they tend to take uh, support of we which we keep referring as technology or say high technology what if we adopt the reverse way and uh, try to make it simple it is always easy to complicate things and it is more difficult to make it simple so I'm just giving these pointers uh, if we think uh, for new smart cities to be evolved based on such principles. Uh, say another point which I would like to put up is uh, degradation of resources, then information, infrastructure boom. Uh, as we are looking forward for huge growth and be trying to become a superpower, and we are also now accommodating we as a supplier of global demands for tomorrow. Then uh, we are changing very fast. West and East is getting fused. Uh, as we see, we are evolving as a dynamic fusion culture. And, uh, but, but rapid urbanization is also congesting cities. And uh, our Modi ji have now declared something called Made in India. And a lot is happening on this front. But here we would like to put one more pointer is uh, how much is this contextual of all those things which are being put really for India? Like uh, we have been contesting on metro city, uh, metro solutions. DMRC is one of the wonderful projects, but I think a lot of cities are now being ravaged with uh, this transportation solution as a unique public transportation. The, the best transportation system could be really multimodal and multimodal to the extent of uh, majority or I would say the metro and BRT is really a fiasco. How we can change this and really make it contextual made for India? Another principle which we must look at for uh, new cities design is which was our years of tradition from ancient India that we used to be minimal in consumption then we used to reuse things or we used to repair, we used to rebuild, refurbish, refinish or we used to sell it from higher society strata to lower society like our TVs and fridges, there are secondary and tertiary markets to buy. Recycling, which is a buzzword now. But nothing of this, if it can fulfill, then I think it should be restricted, redesigned. And if it cannot be restricted or redesigned, it should be removed. So maybe there is a suggestion that while making these cities, is such an opportunity of making these hundreds of cities, we should make a manual of what not to do and how to shade away many more which look essential at the uh, on the face of it but can be avoided uh, there is a new rule which is coming up in uh, my city i belong to pune 
which is uh, recently heard that they are going to make this FSI 4. Now, this is going to add volumes in the city. And I always wonder what's going to happen. Uh, first is there will be a lot of reciting, uh, so-called uh, wealthy because they are holding costly plots today, but they will get recited. And then there will be developers putting up 200, 300, 400 meter towers like we have seen World 1, many of them will come up. Sorry to we interrupt, but now the five minutes. Okay. This, uh, just simple calculation, one square meter of a land, with that rule, if you have an average height of three and a half meters, I think it's almost 14 cubic meters you add, or you're allowed to add. Now, when such kind of volumes which we are going to get up in air, and then support services below ground, uh, it is going to tax not only on the resources, but also uh, going to kill visually. So, in our structural engineering principle, we always used to say uh, less is more, or achieve more with less. But for such creations of these cities, I think uh, it should be reversed. More should look less. If, if in some way, if this can be put forth, and methodologies of those things, like how to make buildings, say, convertible, the facades open up, so that the volumes, uh, internal volumes become participative to external and they look sleek. I'm talking very vague, but these are just ideas and thoughts came to my mind, and I'm expressing them. Uh, compaction of crowd, as I said, more should be less. And uh, this is part one. Part two, I would like to just run through quickly. How many minutes? Two, three. Uh, this, uh, some of the projects which are like individual buildings, uh, I'm just making a pun out of the beauty and bees, but this, uh, contrast of conventional buildings and then there are some of the structures which create spaces and feelings. Uh, this is of course a useless art for daily life, but maybe sometimes useful for nothing. Uh, just sails along some dam backwater having light and shadow, uh, light and sound plays for evenings, gatherings on the waterfront. Then this is uh, a large beast. It's a free form airport at Bhopal. Now such elements uh, do invoke some kind of emotions uh, in the city. And if we create such structures, I think it could be very, very useful. Now, say for example, this beauty is on this beast. Externally, this is the building. Or this beauty is on this beast. Or this beauty is on this beast. This is just beauty standing alone, or beauty under the beast. <laughs> I don't know how contextual I am. I'm just putting up some points in the whole city fabric. These could be essential elements in the city fabric. Uh, this was the, as someone said, backyard spaces. I think PK, you talked about backyard spaces, and this was the some kind of a backyard space for the building in between. That there was, this was a dead space here, and this was the rear of the building, and then it was just converted into a main entrance and useful front space for the building. So some such ideas are, even the bridges can be an emotional medium in urban landscape to express or make people little less stressed. It's a connection above underpass. Or uh, this one, another 
pivoted swinging bridge with centrally pivoted down below not thick really and look at the free pedestrian spaces because of simple single supports or right in the middle of conventional crowds simple slick structures maybe such elements uh, we should emphasize to add and uh, sometimes then people find their own spaces this was very interesting of course this is last slide now uh, what i found interesting is this is a bridge in nanded and uh, it was being used by people like an auditorium for events right? <laughs> i think uh, we should take care because whatever we create becomes collectively the whole city fabric so uh, city fabric is often an expression of people culture and their fineness or coarseness of people so whenever there are smart cities being discussed what i think is uh, even the pune commissioner has tried this uh, specially pk i would like to say is uh, participative initiatives uh, which uh, i think even you successfully did in bombay is something which uh, is being tried for smart cities and that could be really interesting and uh, along with the technology and systems if they become participative and contextual to what uh, not only that city is specialized for but also culturally what it was and rich and if this can be very seriously put forth along with these small small pointers and such simple structures this smart city could be more reliving and interesting i think thank you mr dhananjay i request you to please stay back and now i would request mr rathun and dr kalgul and ms sarita vijayan to please join us and uh, bell about the point of why the focus on aesthetics be viewed as vital component for a smart society thank you so much which is the most beautiful building in delhi just randomly delhi hat somebody said which context which is a very good point yeah lotus temple anybody else it's okay you can be a little brighter i know it's been a heavy day kutub minar kutub minar you are not supposed to answer that what is this race course yes humayun stum and that's actually my first question how does one define beauty in a city context i mean you know it, it, if i have to give a bollywood example salman khan movie raking 250 crores i mean that's not even a, that's not even a movie you know what i mean see finally the audience is alive oh my god it took salman khan to do this not an architect could do that so how do you define beauty really you know in the context of a city I don't know why we need to define beauty. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, beauty is different things to different people. So, and I've always had this problem with trying to choose my favorite building or choose the most beautiful building or stuff like that. And uh, I don't know why we need to define it. Yeah, context as somebody said rightly, context changes the beauty. So so many things are beautiful like as as uh, even he said no beauty lies in the eyes of beholder lot of things are beautiful and uh, beautiful is also a process or an object if we and also it can be a discourse of 
objects and processes together. It reminds me one of the time I had been to uh, Delhi Heart, of course, is one of it. And another is Chandani Chowk, for example. Or he said, a marine drive during festival time. These are objects and processes together. That also can be a very interesting beauty. Or Rambla Street in Barcelona. Street alone is not as beautiful when it is along with the process and that animation and then you being a part of that animation. That can be a beauty. So, uh, people participating, getting emotional, passionate, compassionate for in the city while living and using it is the beauty, I think. Dr. Kargal? Yeah, I tend to agree with Dhananjay. One, what is the, uh, what is it that the person who is either visiting or staying there feel pleasant about it? You know, the whole city can be beautiful or there can be beauty spots in the city. There are two ways of looking at it. Of course, several beauty spots could make the city beautiful or he may feel that he has visited a beautiful city or he is living in a beautiful city. So, generally, anything which is having order, which is neat, in the sense, okay, it could have various uh, pockets of uh, ugly spots, again in the eyes of the beholder, but generally, I feel something which has a neatness about it would make people feel that it is beautiful. You know, um, Pratham, one more thing, one more thing. Uh, by then I thought something more, sorry. Uh, <laughs> for a citizen, sense of belonging and ownership for the city is a beauty. For the city. One more thing, yeah. You can applaud to that one actually. Uh, Ratan, we've talked very often about the fact, you know, one of the, the most amazing things about your Marine Drive project is that um, you chose as a designer um, not to design, at, uh, you know, in a certain <coughs> sense and leave it open-ended. Um, but, you know, that creates its own set of problems. You know, you come with a sensitivity and an exposure and a, you know, a kind of an experience to be able to do that. You know, in India you have either decorative or, um, for the lack of a better word, nothing. Um, you know, how does one reconcile that again? You know, because we don't have standard... Um, I don't, uh, you know, our, our um, so-called um, standards for public spaces, public infrastructure, they don't meet base standards. And um, is that one of the reasons why we have such um, bad-looking cities? I mean, like Dr. Kalgal said, disorderly cities, is that uh, a way to uh, say it? Uh, there are standards for everything. So, so it's, it's a question of how you interpret those standards. Uh, I think we just have a completely different set of problems in our Indian cities. We have a population which is just uncontrollable and by any standards is just completely out of whack, out of any proportion. Uh, things that you design and, and sometimes, you know, things are designed for, say, 2015, but they start construction in 2030. Like, like most of the stuff that we do. So you've got, you've got problems that you've designed or, or perceived in 1990 and you start construction in 2010. That's 20 years past. So you're going to get these pressures and these unfortunately are bureaucratic or political pressures that, that delay projects and stuff like that. Uh, I think, I think the, we've been robbed of our sensitivity, we've been robbed of our cultures, we've been robbed of our unique identities, because we're trying to do too much with too little probably, we're trying to do too much with different influences from all over the world. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not satisfied with uh, maybe the colors that we've been imbibed with or given through our, our original arts and crafts probably. We're looking for new stuff to happen. We're not, uh, we're not, we're not, we're restricted by resources probably sometimes. We're obviously talking about a coping mechanism. And that's where you start getting overcrowded, you start getting over-designed sometimes. Uh, and, and it's a painful process. That's probably why urban design or urban architecture in an Indian context doesn't really work. We've got these bastardized sort of versions of all sorts of colonial styles that are happening, uh, only because architects are trying to express themselves differently. 
and I'm not sure you can stop that. Uh, how do you sensitize architects to that? It's, it's a very, very sophisticated sensitivity that we're talking about. I don't know whether you can study it, whether you, whether you imbibe it from exposure and awareness, or, or whether you're just born with it. I'm not sure. Uh, Dhananjay, as an engineer, I mean, you're perhaps uh, a f you know, one of the few who kind of builds in aesthetics in design. When you're, when you're thinking, even the engineering of a product or a project, um, why is that important to an engineer? You know, should he consider that as an integral part? I mean, that's the architect's job for most people, right? Most people think that, right? He's getting uh, offended now. <clears throat> Fortunately or unfortunately, I think engineering is mathematics and aesthetics is uh, intangible and debatable and subjective. But uh, minimalism in engineering uh, is something, a path which can be followed and becomes a language of aesthetics. That is the route I have taken and it seems to be working. Uh, in general, popularism of what structures are being looked at. So, uh, from that point of view and in every way, I think uh, this works. Did I make sense or anything? Well, I don't know. The audience will tell you. If they applaud, you made sense. No, you didn't make sense. Oh my God, who said that? <laughs> Who's that brave guy? <laughs> no, what did it? Yeah. Um, sorry? No, what was it No, she said, said you, you didn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dr. Kalwal, you know, you've, you've taught so many students. And, um, you know, now with smart as the new buzzword, it, being, it brings another, uh, another image of beauty into a city. You know, a homogeneous, Western-aided model of, uh, you know, how a city should look. You know, um, how does, um, you know, how do you teach young, youngsters um, to really be sensitized uh, when they design? I mean, you know, how, how, you know, how do you deal with that? Uh, well, I, I have taught uh, civil engineering students, I have taught architecture students. So I have taught both the, yeah. uh, you know, class of people. Uh, basically, it's the physical understanding of the behavior, the way things behave. There's no need to do any calculations if they know exactly how things tend to behave. An architect can do a wonderful job, an engineer can assist him in that. And when, it, when you said about codes of practice or whatever, those are only guidelines. What is required is the inherent capability to visualize, to imagine and use the latest that is available. There are so many products that have come up, so many you know, excellent uh, uh, materials that are available. It's only when an engineer and an architect work together right from conception because somebody was talking about vertical cities. Now, as you go taller, there are so many forces that come into picture which may look fine, but then it might be impossible. I mean, there might be certain, uh, you know, certain things that we will have to see because as he was saying, we are looking at minimal intrusion or minimal intervention as I can say with structures which are safe, durable, and elegant by being simple. It's not necessary that it must be gaudy colored or it must be having, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, forms and shapes. Very simple, very good looking, but functional structures can be built. So what is required among the students is that urge to visualize the behavior of the structure as a whole and as elements. That will lead to... Yes. You know, uh codes of practice and, and uh, sort of any, any codes that are put up, policy uh, and new first guidelines, anything, are really the bare minimum. And any buildings that are done only following codes land up with mediocrity because that's the bare minimum and if you achieve that, you feel you've achieved something. But I think that's the important thing, get out from code and try and experiment with, with different stuff. And I guess when engineers and architects understand each other's businesses, I think that's when music happens. Yeah, and the impact of… Uh, this, time you better make, this time you better make sense, Rathana, <laughs> she's watching. <laughs> I'm just saying. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <That's>... uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, what I was trying, I, I just hey. forgot what I said. <laughs> you're, you're intimidating him now, absolutely <laughs> intimidating him. Uh, like, like I said, as I said, engineering is mathematics. Uh, there is also another interesting mathematics which can shape the city buildings. Say, for example, when uh, the Berlin Wall was taken down and there was amalgamation, and then East Berlin was being developed at a furious pace, then there was a, a rule book. And that entire new East Berlin development, Potsdamer Platz, for example, is uh, it's like a mathematics. I mean, it's a reflection of the rule book. It's cold sterile, but also there are some warm spots. Uh, so, technology is changing fast, emerging. Implementation speeds are uh, also quite a bit. So, I think instead of these uh, traditional ways of making rules and setting them, we should have a, a dynamism in setting the rules as the technology comes in being implemented by private players and they can easily surpass and dominate the city skyline. Uh, we should have a fast, responsive, dynamic uh, rule system, intelligent, active, responsive rule system. It re needs to relook at the entire system or administration. Maybe this is a necessity. Okay, I'm the timekeeper and I have overshortened time. So thank you, uh, gentlemen, for your time and thank you for this session. Uh, we'll go on straight on to our next. Uh, we'll, uh, and I'll let the, uh, the MC take over. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I was going to say ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>